Chapter Eighteen of A Distinguished Provincial at Paris by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Eighteen. Next morning at eight o'clock, Lucien went to Etienne Lousteau's room, found it empty, and hurried away to Florine. Lousteau and Florine, settled into possession of their new quarters like a married couple, received their friend in the pretty bedroom and all three breakfasted sumptuously together why i should advise you my boy to come with me to see felicien vernou said lousteau when they sat at table and lucien had mentioned coralie's projected supper ask him to be of the party and keep well with him if you can keep well with such a rascal felicien vernou does a feuilleton for a political paper he might perhaps introduce you and you could blossom out into leaders in it at your ease it is a liberal paper like ours you will be a liberal that is the popular party and besides if you mean to go over to the ministerialists you would do better for yourself if they had reason to be afraid of you then there is hector merlin and his madame du val noble you meet great people at their house dukes and dandies and millionaires didn't they ask you and coralie to dine with them yes replied lucien you are going too and so is florine lucien and etienne were now on familiar terms after friday's debauch and the dinner at the rocher de cancale very well merlin is on the paper we shall come across him pretty often he is the chap to follow close on finot's heels you would do well to pay him attention ask him and madame de val noble to supper he may be useful to you before long for rancorous people are always in need of others and he may do you a good turn if he can reckon on your pen your beginning has made enough sensation to smooth your way said florine take advantage of it at once or you will soon be forgotten the bargain the great business is concluded lousteau continued that finot without a spark of talent in him is to be editor of dauriat's weekly paper with a salary of six hundred francs per month and owner of a sixth share for which he has not paid one penny and i my dear fellow am now editor of our little paper everything went off as i expected florine managed superbly she could give points to talleyrand himself we have a hold on men through their pleasures said florine while a diplomatist only works on their self-love a diplomatist sees a man made up for the occasion we know him in his moments of folly so our power is greater and when the thing was settled matifat made the first and last joke of his whole druggist's career put in lousteau he said this affair is quite in my line i am supplying drugs to the public i suspect that florine put him up to it cried lucien and by these means my little dear your foot is in the stirrup continued lousteau you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth remarked florine what lots of young fellows wait for years wait till they are sick of waiting for a chance to get an article into a paper you will do like emile blondet in six months time you will be giving yourself high and mighty airs she added with a mocking smile in the language of her class haven't i been in paris for three years said lousteau and only yesterday finot began to pay me a fixed monthly salary of three hundred francs and a hundred francs per sheet for his paper well you are saying nothing exclaimed florine with her eyes turned on lucien we shall see said lucien my dear boy if you had been my brother i could not have done more for you retorted lousteau somewhat nettled but i won't answer for finot scores of sharp fellows will besiege finot for the next two days with offers to work for low pay i have promised for you but you can draw back if you like you little know how lucky you are he added after a pause all those in our set combine to attack an enemy in various papers and lend each other a helping hand all round let us go in the first place to felicien vernou said lucien he was eager to conclude an alliance with such formidable birds of prey 
lousteau sent for a cab and the pair of friends drove to vernou's house on the second floor up an alley in the rue mandar to lucien's great astonishment the harsh fastidious and severe critic's surroundings were vulgar to the last degree a marbled paper cheap and shabby with a meaningless pattern repeated at regular intervals covered the walls and a series of aqua tints in gilt frames decorated the apartment where vernou sat at a table with a woman so plain that she could only be the legitimate mistress of the house and two very small children perched on high chairs with a bar in front to prevent the infants from tumbling out felicien vernou in a cotton dressing-gown contrived out of the remains of one of his wife's dresses was not over well pleased by this invasion have you breakfasted lousteau he asked placing a chair for lucien we have just left florine we have been breakfasting with her lucien could not take his eyes off madame vernou she looked like a stout homely cook with a tolerably fair complexion but commonplace to the last degree the lady wore a bandana tied over her nightcap the strings of the latter article of dress being tied so tightly under the chin that her puffy cheeks stood out on either side a shapeless beltless garment fastened by a single button at the throat enveloped her from head to foot in such a fashion that a comparison to a milestone at once suggested itself her health left no room for hope her cheeks were almost purple her fingers looked like sausages in a moment it dawned upon lucien how it was that vernou was always so ill at ease in society here was the living explanation of his misanthropy sick of his marriage unable to bring himself to abandon his wife and family he had yet sufficient of the artistic temper to suffer continually from their presence vernou was an actor by nature bound never to pardon the success of another condemned to chronic discontent because he was never content with himself lucien began to understand the sour look which seemed to add to the bleak expression of envy on vernou's face the acerbity of the epigrams with which his conversation was sown the journalist's pungent phrases keen and elaborately wrought as a stiletto were at once explained let us go into my study vernou said rising from the table you have come on business no doubt yes and no replied etienne lousteau it is a supper old chap i have brought a message from coralie said lucien madame vernou looked up at once at the name to ask you to supper to-night at her house to meet the same company as before at florine's and a few more besides hector merlin and madame du val-noble and some others there will be play afterwards but we are engaged to madame mahoudeau this evening dear put in the wife what does that matter returned vernou she will take offence if we don't go and you are very glad of her when you have a bill to discount this wife of mine my dear boy can never be made to understand that a supper engagement for twelve o'clock does not prevent you from going to an evening party that comes to an end at eleven she is always with me while i work he added you have so much imagination said lucien and thereby made a mortal enemy of vernou well continued lousteau you are coming but that is not all monsieur de rubempre is about to be one of us so you must push him in your paper give him out for a chap that will make a name for himself in literature so that he can put in at least a couple of articles every month yes if he means to be one of us and will attack our enemies as we will attack his i will say a word for him at the opera to-night replied vernou very well good-bye till to-morrow my boy said lousteau shaking hands with every sign of cordiality when is your book coming out that depends on dauriat it is ready said vernou paterfamilias are you satisfied yes and no we will get up a success said lousteau and he rose with a bow to his colleague's wife the abrupt departure was necessary indeed for the two infants engaged in a noisy quarrel were fighting with their spoons and flinging the pap in each other's faces 
that my boy is a woman who all unconsciously will work great havoc in contemporary literature said etienne when they came away poor vernou cannot forgive us for his wife he ought to be relieved of her in the interests of the public and a deluge of bloodthirsty reviews and stinging sarcasms against successful men of every sort would be averted what is to become of a man with such a wife and that pair of abominable brats have you seen rigaudin in picard's la maison en lotterie you have well like rigaudin vernou will not fight himself but he will set others fighting he would give an eye to put out both eyes in the head of the best friend he has you will see him using the bodies of the slain for a stepping-stone rejoicing over everyone's misfortunes attacking princes dukes marquises and nobles because he himself is a commoner reviling the work of unmarried men because he forsooth has a wife and everlastingly preaching morality the joys of domestic life and the duties of the citizen in short this very moral critic will spare no one not even infants of tender age he lives in the rue mandar with a wife who might be the mamamouchi of the bourgeois gentilhomme and a couple of little vernus as ugly as sin he tries to sneer at the faubourg saint germain where he will never set foot and makes his duchesses talk like his wife that is the sort of man to raise a howl at the jesuits insult the court and credit the court party with the design of restoring feudal rights and the right of primogeniture just the one to preach a crusade for equality he that thinks himself the equal of no one if he were a bachelor he would go into society if he were in a fair way to be a royalist poet with a pension and the cross of the legion of honor he would be an optimist and journalism offers starting points by the hundred journalism is the giant catapult set in motion by pygmy hatreds have you any wish to marry after this vernou has none of the milk of human kindness in him it is all turned to gall and he is emphatically the journalist a tiger with two hands that tears everything to pieces as if his pen had the hydrophobia it is a case of gunophobia said lucien has he ability he is witty he is a writer of articles he incubates articles he does that all his life and nothing else the most dogged industry would fail to graft a book on his prose felicien is incapable of conceiving a work on a large scale of broad effects of fitting characters harmoniously in a plot which develops till it reaches a climax he has ideas but he has no knowledge of facts his heroes are utopian creatures philosophical or liberal notions masquerading he is at pains to write an original style but his inflated periods would collapse at a pinprick from a critic and therefore he goes in terror of reviews like every one else who can only keep his head above water with the bladders of newspaper puffs what an article you are making out of him that particular kind my boy must be spoken and never written you are turning editor said lucien where shall i put you down at coralie's ah we are infatuated said lousteau what a mistake do as i do with florine let coralie be your housekeeper and take your fling you would send a saint to perdition laughed lucien well there is no damning a devil retorted lousteau the flippant tone the brilliant talk of this new friend his views of life his paradoxes the axioms of parisian machiavellism all these things impressed lucien unawares theoretically the poet knew that such thoughts were perilous but he believed them practically useful arrived in the boulevard du temple the friends agreed to meet at the office between four and five o'clock hector merlin would doubtless be there lousteau was right the infatuation of desire was upon lucien for the courtesan who loves knows how to grapple her lover to her by every weakness in his nature fashioning herself with incredible flexibility to his every wish encouraging the soft effeminate habits which strengthen her hold 
lucien was thirsting already for enjoyment he was in love with the easy luxurious and expensive life which the actress led he found coralie and camusot intoxicated with joy the gymnase offered coralie an engagement after easter on terms for which she had never dared to hope and this great success is owing to you said camusot yes surely the alcalde would have fallen flat but for him cried coralie if there had been no article i should have been in for another six years of the boulevard theatres she danced up to lucien and flung her arms round him putting an indescribable silken softness and sweetness into her enthusiasm love had come to coralie and camusot his eyes fell looking down after the wont of mankind in moments of sharp pain he saw the seam of lucien's boots a deep yellow thread used by the best bootmakers of that time in strong contrast with the glistening leather the color of that seam had tinged his thoughts during a previous conversation with himself as he sought to explain the presence of a mysterious pair of hessians in coralie's fender he remembered now that he had seen the name of gay rue de la michaudiere printed in black letters on the soft white kid lining you have a handsome pair of boots sir he said like everything else about him said coralie i should be very glad of your bootmaker's address oh how like the rue des bourdonnais to ask for a tradesman's address cried coralie do you intend to patronize a young man's bootmaker a nice young man you would make do keep to your own top boots they are the kind for a steady-going man with a wife and family and a mistress indeed if you would take off one of your boots sir i should be very much obliged persisted camusot i could not get it on again without a button-hook said lucien flushing up berenice will fetch you one we can do with some here jeered camusot papa camusot said coralie looking at him with cruel scorn have the courage of your pitiful baseness come speak out you think that this gentleman's boots are very like mine do you not i forbid you to take off your boots she added turning to lucien yes monsieur camusot yes you saw some boots lying about in the fender here the other day and that is the identical pair and this gentleman was hiding in my dressing-room at the time waiting for them and he had passed the night here that was what you were thinking eh think so i would rather you did it is the simple truth i am deceiving you and if i am i do it to please myself she sat down there was no anger in her face no embarrassment she looked from camusot to lucien the two men avoided each other's eyes i will believe nothing that you do not wish me to believe said camusot don't play with me coralie i was wrong i am either a shameless baggage that has taken a sudden fancy or a poor unhappy girl who feels what love really is for the first time the love that all women long for and whichever way it is you must leave me or take me as i am she said with a queenly gesture that crushed camusot is it really true he asked seeing from their faces that this was no jest yet begging to be deceived i love mademoiselle lucien faltered out at that word coralie sprang to her poet and held him tightly to her then with her arms still about him she turned to the silk mercer as if to bid him see the beautiful picture made by two young lovers poor Mousseau, take all that you gave to me back again i do not want to keep anything of yours for i love this boy here madly not for his intellect but for his beauty i would rather starve with him than have millions with you camusot sank into a low chair hid his face in his hands and said not a word would you like us to go away she asked there was a note of ferocity in her voice which no words can describe cold chills ran down lucien's spine he beheld himself burdened with a woman an actress and a household 
stay here coralie keep it all the old tradesman said at last in a faint unsteady voice that came from his heart i don't want anything back there is the worth of sixty thousand francs here in the furniture but i could not bear to think of my coralie in want and yet it will not be long before you come to want however great this gentleman's talent may be he can't afford to keep you we old fellows must expect this sort of thing coralie let me come and see you sometimes i may be of use to you and i confess it i cannot live without you the poor man's gentleness stripped as he was of his happiness just as happiness had reached its height touched lucien deeply coralie was quite unsoftened by it come as often as you wish poor musot she said i shall like you all the better when i don't pretend to love you camusot seemed to be resigned to his fate so long as he was not driven out of the earthly paradise in which his life could not have been all joy he trusted to the chances of life in paris and to the temptations that would beset lucien's path he would wait a while and all that had been his should be his again sooner or later thought the wily tradesman this handsome young fellow would be unfaithful he would keep a watch on him and the better to do this and use his opportunity with coralie he would be their friend the persistent passion that could consent to such humiliation terrified lucien camusot's proposal of a dinner at verrie's in the palais royal was accepted what joy cried coralie as soon as camusot had departed you will not go back now to your garret in the latin quarter you will live here we shall always be together you can take a room in the rue charlot for the sake of appearances and vogue la galere she began to dance her spanish dance with an excited eagerness that revealed the strength of the passion in her heart if i work hard i may make five hundred francs a month lucien said and i shall make as much again at the theatre without counting extras camusot will pay for my dresses as before he is fond of me we can live like croesus on fifteen hundred francs a month and the horses and the coachman and the footman inquired berenice i will get into debt said coralie and she began to dance with lucien i must close with finot after this lucien exclaimed there said coralie i will dress and take you to your office i will wait outside in the boulevard for you with the carriage lucien sat down on the sofa and made some very sober reflections as he watched coralie at her toilet it would have been wiser to leave coralie free than to start all at once with such an establishment but coralie was there before his eyes and coralie was so lovely so graceful so bewitching that the more picturesque aspects of bohemia were in evidence and he flung down the gauntlet to fortune berenice was ordered to superintend lucien's removal and installation and coralie triumphant radiant and happy carried off her love her poet and must needs go all over paris on the way to the rue saint fiacre lucien sprang lately up the staircase and entered the office with an air of being quite at home coloquent was there with the stamped paper still on his head and old giroudeau told him again hypocritically enough that no one had yet come in but the editor and contributors must meet somewhere or other to arrange about the journal said lucien very likely but i have nothing to do with the writing of the paper said the emperor's captain resuming his occupation of checking off wrappers with his eternal vroom, vroom. was it lucky or unlucky finot chanced to come in at that very moment to announce his sham abdication and to bid giroudeau watch over his interests no shilly-shally with this gentleman he is on the staff finot added for his uncle's benefit as he grasped lucien by the hand oh is he on the paper exclaimed giroudeau much surprised at this friendliness well sir you came on without much difficulty i want to make things snug for you here lest etienne should bamboozle you continued finot looking knowingly at lucien 
this gentleman will be paid three francs per column all round including theatres you have never taken any one on such terms before said giroudeau opening his eyes and he will take the four boulevard theatres see that nobody sneaks his boxes and that he gets his share of tickets i should advise you nevertheless to have them sent to your address he added turning to lucien and he agrees to write besides ten miscellaneous articles of two columns each for fifty francs per month for one year does that suit you yes said lucien circumstances have forced his hand draw up the agreement uncle and we will sign it when we come downstairs who is the gentleman inquired giroudeau rising and taking off his black silk skull-cap monsieur lucien de rubempre who wrote the article on the alcalde young man you have a gold mine there said the old soldier tapping lucien on the forehead i am not literary myself but i read that article of yours and i liked it that is the kind of thing there's gaiety for you that will bring us new subscribers says i to myself and so it did we sold fifty more numbers is my agreement with lousteau made out in duplicate and ready to sign asked finot speaking aside yes then antedate this gentleman's agreement by one day so that lousteau will be bound by the previous contract finot took his new contributor's arm with a friendliness that charmed lucien and drew him out on the landing to say your position is made for you i will introduce you to my staff myself and to-night lousteau will go round with you to the theatres you can make a hundred and fifty francs per month on this little paper of ours with lousteau as its editor so try to keep well with him the rogue bears a grudge against me as it is for tying his hands so far as you are concerned but you have ability and i don't choose that you shall be subjected to the whims of the editor you might let me have a couple of sheets every month for my review and i will pay you two hundred francs this is between ourselves don't mention it to anybody else i should be laid open to the spite of every one whose vanity is mortified by your good fortune write four articles fill your two sheets sign two with your own name and two with a pseudonym so that you may not seem to be taking the bread out of anybody else's mouth you owe your position to blondet and vignon they think that you have a future before you so keep out of scrapes and above all things be on your guard against your friends as for me we shall always get on well together you and i help me and i will help you you have forty francs worth of boxes and tickets to sell and sixty francs worth of books to convert into cash with that and your work on the paper you will be making four hundred and fifty francs every month if you use your wits you will find ways of making another two hundred francs at least among the publishers they will pay you for reviews and prospectuses but you are mine are you not i can count upon you lucien squeezed finot's hand in transports of joy which no words can express don't let anyone see that anything has passed between us said finot in his ear and he flung open the door of a room in the roof at the end of a long passage on the fifth floor end of chapter eighteen